So our next topic is metabolism. And you've heard and probably used the word metabolism sometime in your lives, right? Talking about, oh, she has a really fast metabolism, or oh, I have a really slow metabolism, or I have a high metabolism, right? So when you think of the word metabolism, what do you think of? What's the common knowledge of when we say the word metabolism? Anybody want to venture a description? What? Burning calories. burning calories. Yeah, burning energy, right? It's about energy. So we have some knowledge of metabolism, but we're going to, you know, that's the forest definition, right? That's the kind of the general definition. It's about burning energy. Um, the, the, we're going to dig down into the trees now of the forest and go into the details of metabolism, what it means in the body and what cells are um, really metabolic and what organelles are involved. So we're going to go into a lot more detail. So why do we care about metabolism? Well, it's going to help you advise your patients on dietary choices. If a patient is coming out of surgery, and it's a little old lady who weighs 80 pounds, doesn't have any fat on her body, she fell down and broke her hip from osteoporosis, and you're discharging her now. Or maybe she's gonna stay with you for a while. Maybe you're working in a rehab unit, or a nursing home, or even the hospital. Helping her make choices on how to repair from that big surgery and recover requires a little bit of knowledge of metabolism. And I see this as a nurse myself, when, I, when the nurse's aides order for our little old ladies who don't have any fat on their body and are recovering. Um, the little old ladies like to order toast and oatmeal and some fruit because sometimes their appetite is off, right? And those are things that taste good, but those aren't always best for healing. So we're gonna talk about that. So when you talk about the word metabolism, it's just a kind of a blanket term for all the chemical reactions that are occurring in our body at any one time. So right now your body is using enzymes to digest your breakfast, or maybe you didn't eat any breakfast and your body and your liver is releasing glycogen to be broken down to glucose to keep your blood sugar up between meals, right? So hopefully you did eat breakfast because the brain works best on glucose and water and oxygen. Those are the three components that we need for metabolism and that's what the brain likes best is glucose, water, and oxygen. So we're all breathing, so we're satisfying that need, right? But if you started your day only with coffee and you didn't eat breakfast and you haven't drank any water, your brain is not optimal in terms of its processing. Caffeine is good to stimulate the brain because I can certainly feel the difference, right? I stumble out of bed, come to the kitchen, nobody talk to me, I go straight to the coffee pot, right? Some of you may be like that too. And then you slowly kind of wake up and okay, I can handle the day now, right? And that's okay because caffeine is a stimulant. And I do recommend students have a little caffeine if they come to class groggy and hating life, right? It's okay to have a little caffeine to get going. But water and sugar are important nutrients. So you were testing today, right? To get your brain really working on, on all engines, eat some breakfast and drink some water before you take a test or come to class. Like you're gonna take a registry exam probably at the end of your schooling, right? Make sure that you, even though you'll be nervous, make sure you have something that has some glucose in it and some water. Okay, so it's important that we understand the concept of metabolism, what goes in, what comes out. So there's two branches of metabolism. They both end in ism, so they're processes. Anabolism is when we're making things, making bigger things from smaller things. For example, when we're taking nucleotides that are around inside the nucleus and making new strands of DNA, or if we're making proteins out at the ribosome that we just talked about, and we're adding amino acids to make a long-stranded protein, that's anabolism. We're making something bigger out of smaller subunits. When people take anabolic steroids, you've heard of that term before, right? Bodybuilders take anabolic steroids, which is testosterone. They're taking that as, a, as an injection, as an extra hormone that's not being produced by their body because they want to make more muscle. So that's an example of anabolism, just building more muscle out of smaller amino acids because muscle is protein, right? So they're bringing in that um, testosterone to stimulate that process. Other people drink protein shakes, right? Because they bring in this protein, these large chain proteins, the digestive system breaks it down into smaller bits, 
and then the muscle cells put it back together to make more muscle. so all of that is anabolism catabolism, i think of cutting down. catabolism cuts so it breaks things down so when you bring food in like a peanut, which is a large protein made up of protein, large chains of amino acids, we break that peanut through the help of digestive enzymes into the individual amino acids. And then that's absorbed by our digestive tract and delivered to the cells. They're going to reassemble those amino acids into a different protein that we need. We don't need peanuts, right? We're not made of peanuts. What we need the amino acids in that peanut to assemble proteins in the body, like insulin, glucagon, collagen, keratin, some of those proteins we talked about in the last unit. So catabolism is cutting things down, breaking things down. And digestion is really a, one of the best examples of catabolism that we're all familiar with. We know that we have to digest things down into smaller units so they can be absorbed by our cells. Because if we don't break it down, if we don't have the digestive enzymes to break food down, it causes digestive upset. These large molecules end up in the lower GI tract, and what do we get? Cramping, gas, diarrhea, constipation. Anybody know what you know, gluten sensitivity is, right? Or celiac disease, or lactose intolerance? That's an inability to absorb and break down larger molecules. And celiac disease adds a piece of an immune reaction to gluten, right? The, the body sees that as foreign and starts to create this allergic reaction. So people get itching and rashes and swelling of the throat and lots of other issues. So we need to be able to break our food down into these smaller subunits, which that process is called catabolism. And anytime we're talking about breaking things down or building things up, it's all about bonds. It's all about chemical bonds. So there's energy in the bonds of the molecules that make up our food. And what are the types of food that are out there? What's the major categories of food types that you can eat? Like ketogenic only eats this. And someone said, carbs, did I hear someone say? So carbs are sugars, right? So those are molecules that have carbon and hydrogen and oxygen bonded in a specific way to make them a carbohydrate. So there's energy in those bonds. When we bring that carbohydrate into our body, whether it's sucrose, fructose, glycogen, some of the long chain carbohydrates, starch, like breads and pastas, our body can easily break those bonds and release that energy. And that energy that's released doesn't stay with us for very long. It's easily released and used, and as a result, how do you feel after you eat some pasta or a bread versus eating a McDonald's burger that's fat and protein? Which one's going to get you hungrier faster? the carbs, right? So carbs are great. They taste good, right? They taste good. They're good for quick energy, but then that energy is burnt and gone very quickly. So what happens is when you have a lot of carbs in our diet, our insulin goes up because insulin rushes out to absorb that glucose into our cells. And then once all that glucose is gone because we use it very easily, insulin crashes, blood sugar crashes and then people are looking for more carbs. And that's where the carb addiction comes in, is we eat a lot of carbs, it f we feel good for a little while, insulin rushes out, blood sugar crashes, and now we're hungry again. Where if you ate more protein and more complex carbs that have other things mixed in them, like fiber, to keep you full longer, then you're not looking for more food again. And that's why people go on low-carb diets, because they know they feel less hungry on that, they have more energy on that, and they don't have that insulin high and low. So it's all about ATP. Whenever we bring energy into the body, we need to take that food stuff, whether it's fat, protein, or carbohydrate, we need to convert it to ATP, adenosine triphosphate. So here's adenine, which is an amino acid. Ribose, you bond ribose to adenine, and then three phosphate groups and we get adenosine triphosphate. And these last two phosphates, those bonds are high energy bonds that when we take a phosphate off, we can put it onto a, a molecule or onto a cell and energize that cell or molecule. We call that phosphorylation, when I add a phosphate to something. 
It's like putting batteries in a radio, right? The radio's dead. I put a battery in it, bam, I can turn it on and it makes music or sound. Same thing with cells. Cells can't do anything until we plop a phosphate on and then that, whatever that is, if it's, the, um, if it's a protein channel, for example, that has to open up an active transport, that protein channel responds when I add a phosphate group to it. So those are high energy bonds and whenever we bring food in, we break the bonds and the goal is to give our cells energy by making this ATP. So glucose is what we need to make ATP. So ATP is the energy currency of the cell. It's the energy currency of the cell. It's what the cells use to move. Like when your muscles contract, they need ATP to contract and move your body. We need glucose, but the cells don't directly use glucose. They convert that glucose into ATP, and that's what we're going to talk about when we say cell metabolism is making, breaking down our food fuels to make ATP to energize our cells. So this is adenosine. How many phosphates do we have? Three, adenosine triphosphate. If I take a phosphate off, I've released energy, then I have adenosine diphosphate. I have two phosphates. I can remove another phosphate from that, and then I have adenosine monophosphate, which is AMP. So you might see these terms, ATP, ADP, AMP. It's just telling us how many phosphates are on there. Okay, adenosine monophosphate, one. Diphosphate, two. Triphosphate, three. Okay, so phosphorylation, again, is just shifting these phosphate groups onto another molecule to give it energy. So it's just like I said, putting batteries in a radio. You're just giving that molecule energy. And where, does the, where do we get ATP from? from our food, right? And if we're not bringing in any food, if you're starving, the body cannot bring in energy, well then what do we use? We break down fat in our body, we convert that to ATP. We break down protein in our body, convert that to ATP. So we find though that the body will break down protein as well as fat. So when people cut their calories too much, when they go on a really strict diet, they burn fat, but they also burn muscle at the same time. And what does the body do when there's not enough energy coming in? What would you do if you were designing a body? If energy, if food is not coming in, what would you do to metabolism? Would you keep it at a high rate? Or would you knock down that metabolism and slow everything down, right? So how do people feel if they're not bringing in enough calories? Tired, and their metabolism slows down. So are they gonna burn fat as efficiently if they're cutting their calories too strictly? No. No, and that's why we talk about the importance of exercise, even if it's just weightlifting. We have to do something to keep our energy level up, to keep our metabolism up, because if we just cut calories, like secretaries who work a desk job, who say, I'm going on a diet, I'm only eating Nutrisystem and all, you know, all these special low calorie things, but I'm not gonna exercise, because I hate that, right? And that's how a lot of people feel they're not gonna lose the weight as fast, or if they do lose weight, it's gonna be in, in muscle as well as fat, and their energy level is gonna go down, and they're not gonna feel strong. So it's important that we, that we fuel our furnace as, and put healthy things into our bodies as well as exercise to really burn fat and be healthier. So cellular respiration is breaking down food fuel, so that's catabolism, right? Because we're breaking down larger things into smaller bits and then we're making ATP from that. Then we take the phosphate from the ATP, add it onto our different molecules in our cells to get movement or whatever the energy is used for. So there's different stages of cellular respiration. The first thing we need to do is bring the food in, right? We've got to bring in the fuel from somewhere else. We're not plants. We can't make our own energy using the sun's light, right? We need to get our energy from outside sources. We are heterotrophs, we call that. So we bring in the food from an outside source. We digest it down with the help of our digestive enzymes. So that's catabolism, right? Then we absorb that energy into our cells. So first into our bloodstream. So it leaves the digestive tract, runs through the liver, is absorbed, across the cells of our small intestine, passes through the liver, the liver you know, gets rid of some stuff, breaks some things down a little more depending what it is, and then we transport it to the, all the cells of the body. 
And then depending what the cells are, what that tissue is, it's going to be some of those products will be reassembled into different things. So in the cell, in the cytoplasm is where this processing occurs. So synthesizing lipids, an example of that, when we absorb our energy and we break our fat in our McDonald's burger down to fatty acids and glycerol, that's absorbed to the bloodstream, delivered to the cells of the body. The cells of the testes and the ovaries grab that, those fatty acids and glycerol, reassemble it. The testes turn it into testosterone. The ovaries turn it into estrogen. Those are lipid molecules that are formed in those cells. What organelles do you know manufacture lipid molecules? So in the cells of the ovaries and the cells of the testes, what organelles will we expect to see a lot of because they're in charge of lipid hormone production, testosterone, estrogen? Do you remember what organelle did that? Do you remember what organelle we talked about last time about protein synthesis? What organelles did we say were involved in making protein things? Ribosomes, Golgi, and rough ER. So it's not, that's not the answer then, right? So what's left? What's a membranous network in the cell that we haven't talked about yet that makes lipid molecules? Smooth ER. Good guess, and that's an educated guess. Very good. The smooth ER. So we would expect to see a lot of smooth ER in the testes and the ovaries because their job is to make lipids. So they're going to take the fatty acids and the glycerol that were broken down and released from our burger, and they're going to put it together and use it to make testosterone and estrogen. So do we need fat in our body? We do, definitely, because aldosterone is another hormone you maybe talked about in general, a &P. That's another fatty hormone. Vitamin D is a, is a fatty vitamin that we need for every cell in the body, it has vitamin D receptors. That helps us with depre fighting depression. It helps our immune system. It helps our skeletal system stay strong and developed. We need vitamin D. And if you're not getting enough vitamin D in your diet, you need to bring it in via a supplement. And we've found that most people, 85% of adults in America, are deficient in vitamin D. So they recommend about 2,000 MIU, or whatever the units are on that, um, a day. So take a look at your diet. Are you getting enough vitamin D? Are you sick a lot? Are you a little bit blue in the winter time? you might need uh, a little vitamin D supplementation. I take it just as a preventative, because why not? All right. <clears throat> um, so then, so we process in the cytoplasm. We synthesis, synthes, synthesize lipids, proteins, and glycogen. So we're going to make those fatty hormones. We're going to make proteins or glycogen. Excess glucose gets stored at glycogen as glycogen in our liver and muscles. And then catabolism, if we bring in food and we need to use it as energy, if we're exercising or taking a test and we're really burning through the, the glucose, you know, we're going to break it down right away into pyruvic acid and acetylcoenzyme A. Don't worry about this yet. We're going to get into those details. So when we're done with breaking down our nutrients, what we end up with as a result, we're trying to make ATP. That's the goal, right? So we take glucose, we break it down, we make ATP, and we have waste products. Carbon dioxide and water are the waste products of cellular metabolism. And that's in our exhale, right? We could verify that. Our exhale gets rid of those waste products of metabolism, carbon dioxide and water. Another waste product that's not listed is heat. And our conversion of glucose to ATP is about the same as a typical engine, a decent quality engine. Um, it's a, a lot is wasted as heat, just like your car exhaust. There's a lot that is lost as heat that goes from the fuel to getting your engine moving. We lose a lot through the exhaust pipe as heat. Same thing with our environment. We have a crowded room, you feel that heat, right? Like when you come into this room in the beginning of the day, it's kind of chilly in here. And then as we get 36 bodies in here and you're all metabolizing and releasing that waste heat, the room warms up. Okay, so we're going to talk about some reactions, some special chemical reactions that occur when we talk about cellular metabolism, and that's oxidation reduction reactions. And maybe you've heard about this, or this is bringing back P 
PTSD flashbacks to chemistry in high school and you don't really want, or you took it across the street, maybe you don't want to think about this again, but we're going to use it in a real practical way. And when we talk about oxidation, one easy thing to remember is oxidation is defined as the gain of oxygen or the loss of hydrogen. So if we're gaining oxygen or losing hydrogen, we call that oxidation. And it makes sense. Oxidation, gaining oxygen, that kind of fits. Or losing hydrogen atoms. So when we bring in food, what we find is any food we bring in, we say it's oxidized because we remove hydrogens from it. So most of the food we bring in, all the food we bring in is carbo carbohydrate, lipid, lipids, and proteins are the major categories of foods we bring in. Those are all a combination of carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. So if we keep removing the hydrogens off through the process of cellular metabolism, all we have left is carbon dioxide because carbon dioxide has no hydrogens on it, right? So we remove hydrogens, hydrogens, and we keep using those hydrogens to fuel the processes, which we'll talk about. We end up with carbon dioxide, and that's our waste product. The body can't use carbon dioxide for anything specific, so it's given off in our exhale. So we have all these enzymes that help these processes occur, and they occur more efficiently when we have vitamin B as a helper enzyme. It's a coenzyme. So have you heard when people are really tired, not feeling well, they'll say, hey, how much vitamin B12 are you getting? B12, B6, having those excess vitamins in our diet helps metabolism run more efficiently. And where do we find vitamin B? What types of foods? All the foods that we say are healthy, right? Whole grains, vegetables, those fruits, those all contain vitamin B. And that's why people who will tell you that they eat clean, that they got rid of the junk food and started fueling their bodies with whole grains, fruits, and vegetables, how much better they feel and how much energy they have. I've done it myself. I'm a major junk food junkie when I want to be. And then when I say that's enough of that and I start eating healthy again, boy, do I feel different. No headaches, no body aches. Like when you wake up in the morning, you're like, oh, achy and stiff. You know, I always thought, well, that's just age. Actually, no, it's not just age, because I felt like that in my 20s, too, when I was eating junky food. So when we eat clean, we're providing these coenzymes for metabolism, and we have more energy. When we eat junky, when we eat comfort foods like pizzas and donuts and sandwiches and fatty things, then we don't feel well. And then what do you do? When you don't feel well and you have low energy, the brain says, hungry, hungry, I need food, I don't feel well, I have low energy. So people start eating that more of that food, thinking it's going to give them energy, but it doesn't actually takes away from their energy. Lack of sleep does the same thing. When you, when you, if you're a third shift worker or you're someone who stays up all night playing video games or on your phone and then you get up for class and you're like, oh, you've had four or five hours of sleep, the brain says, hey, we're really low on energy. Let's eat. We're hungry. We're hungry. Come on, we got to fuel this body. We're tired. But the reality is your body needs sleep, not food. And this is the bad cycle that we get into. And for those of you that are going into nursing, I can tell you that that's a big problem that, that nurses will complain about is weight gain and low energy when they get into nursing because of not getting good sleep. Because sometimes just the way your schedule, someone, how many of you work in the healthcare field now? Is there a scheduling problem sometimes with, you know, do they allow you time for sleep? Not always, right? Especially if you're on a day-night rotation. Some people will work third shift, they get a day off, and then they're on day shift. How do you switch from one to the other, right? So important to get these vitamins and have sleep so we're fueling our metabolism. So two important coenzymes we're going to talk about are NAD plus and FAD. This NAD plus is a coenzyme that helps metabolism. We'll see how it does in a little bit. This comes from niacin. This is an important vitamin that you might see in your foods. If you look at your vitamin pills, you'll see that niacin is an important component of a healthy diet and in our vitamin pills or vitamin supplements. And this comes from riboflavin. FAD is a component that comes from riboflavin. So those are two important things that we get in our food. 
that helps metabolism. Because you've heard of empty calories before, right? A donut is an example of an empty calorie. What is a donut made of? Sugar, flour, fat. Is there any vitamin A, vitamin B, vitamin D, riboflavin, niacin? Nothing, right? So that's why we say those calories are empty. They fill our body. They provide us with glucose, but they don't really fuel metabolism. So you have the insulin rush, and then the insulin crash, and then you feel terrible. Feeling great when it's going down, though, right? Because it tastes good, and it's got fat in it. makes you, you know, fuel you for a little while. But fueling metabolism, it's empty. Okay, so when glucose enters a cell, it enters by facilitated diffusion and secondary active transport. But you don't need to know that. Just that's just a little refresher from general A and P. It's phosphorylated. What does that mean again? To phosphorylate a molecule? Yeah, we just pull a phosphate off of an existing ATP that was made previously, and we plop it onto glucose. So now glucose is no longer glucose. It's called glucose six phosphate. The reason for that is, is how do things move, facilitated diffusion, from higher concentration to lesser concentration? So by bringing it in and changing it into something else that, can, that promotes the diffusion from the bloodstream or from the cytoplasm or from the bloodstream into the cell, right? We don't want it to stop. We want to continually be using glucose. So by changing it into something else, that maintains the concentration gradient so we keep having glucose flowing in. So we cannot reverse the reaction and release glucose. Once we make glucose 6-phosphate, it's going to proceed onward into, into the cell organelles for cellular respiration. But if we need to release glucose, we need to reverse that reaction with an enzyme take the phosphate off, kick glucose back out of the cell so the body can use it somewhere else. Where do we see that? Only in three organs, in the intestines, the kidney, and the liver. So they can release glucose from cells if needed. Every other cell takes it in and it stays in that cell. It's not going back out to the blood. So again, why do we do that? So we can keep the glucose concentration low so we continue to diffuse glucose from the blood into the cells. So here's the overall reaction for cellular respiration. We have glucose, which was a byproduct of our digestive processes. And we brought our donut in, or we ate our McDonald's fries. We broke it down with the help of digestive enzymes into glucose. The glucose enters our cell with the help of oxygen. That glucose is broken down into carbon dioxide and water. Those are the waste products. Lots of ATP, 32 ATP molecules for one glucose. That's pretty darn good. And waste heat. So this is your body temperature, right, is waste heat. So that's why you can go outside on a really cold day when it's 10 below and you don't freeze rock solid, right? Because you're constantly producing heat. As long as you're alive, your body's metabolizing all the time. You're always burning fuel, always making ATP. So that's why you're always going to be, you know, 98.6. What happens if body temperature is higher? What does that tell you about this reaction if we have higher body temperature? What? Yeah, we're working harder, right? If we're releasing more heat, we're working harder. So there's a phrase called feed a fever, starve a cold. Does it make sense? If someone has a fever, they're going to need more calories because their, their, their body is working overtime. Cellular respiration is increased. And we're releasing chemicals called pyrogens to raise body temperature to kill bacteria and viruses. That's the reason for fever, right? So we need to be aware that when people's body temperatures are higher, they need more fuel. Right? Just like if you're outside, when it's hot out, you're hungry and thirsty. Like you go to the fairs, the area festivals, when it's 95 degrees. You can eat lunch, like me, I can feed the kids and eat lunch, do everything. We get out there half an hour later, I'm hungry, I'm hungry. Because of that heat just makes you burn calories faster. So we need to think about that in our patients. Patients that have a fever and are ill, they need more fuel even though they may not want to eat, right? So try to give them simple things that they'll eat to keep that energy level up. So 
oxygen is present. So without oxygen, we can't make all that 32 molecules of ATP. So what happens if we get a blood clot to the heart or a blood clot to the brain? What happens to the cells in those organs? They're not getting oxygen or glucose because it's not being delivered, right? And they're not going to survive. How long can we live without oxygen? Depends on the body temperature. If it's someone falls through the ice, you know, and isn't breathing and is down there for a half an hour, we have been able to revive people that have been underneath the ice for half an hour. But in class like this on a typical day, about five minutes because we have hemoglobin that will deliver oxygen that's already in our body and that'll keep us alive for about five minutes. After that, it's over. We're not going to make ATP, cells die, and we're done. So that's why it's really important when someone is choking or someone drops over for whatever reason that we assess the situation and if their heart is beating, open up their airway, turn them on their side, make sure they're getting oxygen. People have died sometimes from passing out from low blood sugar and their neck was down and they couldn't get air and they died just because of that, because everybody just stood back and stared. So if someone has passed out, make sure you, know, you lift their chin up and that they're getting air. And another one is if they've passed out because of a heart problem, we gotta give them those chest compressions, right? We've gotta deliver oxygen, because we find that just compressing the chest and releasing it, what's the depth of that, you remember? Close. Two inches. So you gotta go down two inches, up two inches. When we do that with the chest, we find that that also brings in air and is enough, we could, some people, like if you're, like if you're, let's say you're walking downtown La Crosse coming home from a gathering, and so, person, I'll just leave it at that, right? Um, a person has passed out on the side of the road, maybe it's a heroin user, maybe they have vomit around their mouth. You gonna wanna put your mouth on that and do mouth to mouth? Probably not, right? But just cut chest compressions alone have saved lives. So you don't have to feel obligated to give breaths. Even if you just give the chest compressions and have someone call 911, you can save lives. <clears throat> okay, so the process of breaking down glucose, so that's why it's catabolism. We're breaking down glucose, converting it to ATP. Three steps, glycolysis, the Krebs cycle, and the electron transport chain. So glycolysis is the first step. So this is where we take that sugar molecule and we break it down through a series of steps. First, we activate the sugar, and that's by putting that phosphate on it. So we had to use an ATP to do that, right? And then we break the sugar into two. That glucose 6-phosphate gets broken into two pieces. That's called sugar cleavage. And then we oxidize it. And this is oxidizing means we're removing hydrogens. So let's look at the first step. So we take this glucose, we take two ATPs, and we put a phosphate on either side of it. This is called fructose 1,6-biphosphate. Yeah, I don't expect you to remember that name. That's not important. The only thing you need to know is that we use 2-ATP. We take a phosphate from 2-ATP and plop it on either side. And then we split that into two. This is the sugar cleavage part. Now we have two smaller pieces. So that's the cleavage step. Then we go through a series of steps, which is, make sure I catch up here. Um, of losing hydrogen atoms. So we say that this sugar now that's been formed, this glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate, that releases hydrogens and they're added to this coenzyme NAD plus. So NAD plus becomes NADH. So we're pulling off hydrogens off of this sugar, this special sugar we've made, and forming NADH plus H plus. And in the same process, we're taking these phosphates 
and making ATP from that, a total of four ATP molecules for one sugar. But remember, we had to use two ATP to get this whole process started, right, in the activation phase. So how many ATP do we have at the end of these three steps? We used two, we made four. What's the net? Two. So we have two ATP at the end of this process. So we have two ATP, and we have a special molecule called pyruvic acid. That's what's left from my glucose that started. We have pyruvic acid and two ATP. That's the process of glycolysis. So this happens in the cytoplasm. So this whole process here, this glycolysis, happens in the cytoplasm, does not require oxygen. So oxygen was not used in this activation, cleavage, oxidation process. And we ended up with two ATP. So we don't need oxygen for glycolysis. It happens in the cytoplasm. But if oxygen is present, if we're breathing and there's lots of oxygen available in the environment, then we're going to take it to the next step, which is called the citric acid cycle or the Krebs cycle. But if there isn't, person has a blood clot to the heart, blood clot to the brain, blood clot to the lung, called a pulmonary embolism. If there is no oxygen delivery to this tissue, the cell is going to switch to another step, and that's called anaerobic metabolism, because it means there's no oxygen available. When glycolysis is done, it's going to break that pyruvic acid down into lactic acid. And lactic acid is shown here. That's the burn we feel when we do intense, short bursts, bursts of exercise without enough oxygen available. You start to feel that burn. Like if, let's say you're late for class and you come running up the steps, that's a lot of muscle usage and not enough oxygen to fuel that. So what happens is lactic acid builds up in your muscles and you feel that burn. And then you get to the top of the stairs and what are you doing when you get to the top of the stairs? Huffing and puffing, right? <laughs> That's repaying your oxygen debt. Because what happened is your body produced all this lactic acid, and now you need to get rid of that lactic acid and convert it back to glucose to be used the normal way. So the body asks for more oxygen to do that. And the only way to deliver more oxygen is to instigate deeper, faster breathing. So that's why you're huffing and puffing when you get to the top of the steps. And here's the good news. Even if you're in great shape, and a marathon runner, a triathlete, whatever, you are always going to be huffing and puffing when you run the stairs. Because for us to get a lot of ATP, enough ATP to fuel that muscle in our legs to go the stairs over that short period of time, it takes time to go through these next two steps we're going to talk about, which is the Krebs cycle and electron transport chain. Those enzymes take time to kick in and all that before we get to those 32 precious ATP that are going to fuel our activity. So whenever we start exercise, we're always going to feel the burn. We're always going to be breathing heavier when we get started until this, these next two steps kick in. So it's not a sign that you're in bad shape if you're huffing and puffing at the top of the stairs. But how long it takes you to recover from the huffing and puffing is an indicator of what kind of shape you're in. And you'll notice that if you're going up the steps with a friend who you know is exercising and goes to the Y every day or goes to a, a fitness class, she'll be back to normal talking within five minutes of climbing the stairs where another person's going to be huffing and puffing still. So that's the difference, is, is how quickly we recover. And we're going to measure that, your fitness, in lab this semester. We're going to do a five mile, or five mile, uh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I won't say that. A one mile walk, as fast as you can walk a mile, and then we're going to measure your resting heart rate right away and see how quick that heart rate recovers. And that's an indication of your fitness. Okay, so if there's no oxygen, what happens to the pyruvic acid? What happens to the pyruvic acid if there's not enough oxygen? What does it con get converted to? Lactic acid, lactic acid. And too much acid building up in the blood is not a good thing. Again, how do we get rid of the lactic acid? What did I say you're going to do at the top of the stairs? You're going to deep breathe. You're going to huff and puff, and you're going to convert with the extra oxygen that's going to convert that lactic acid back to glucose and get rid of it. 
But what happens if you're having an uncontrolled seizure and you have chronic muscular contraction? Are you huffing and is a, is a person huffing and puffing during a seizure? No. So what's happening to lactic acid levels in their body while that's happening? It's rising. And acid levels does what to pH? Low pH means high acid levels. So that can drop pH. And if we drop pH in the blood, that causes enzyme damage. Enzymes don't work properly at, at the wrong pH. So those patients are at risk of acidosis anytime they're not getting enough oxygen. How about a person with COPD that's not getting the oxygen needed because someone reduced the oxygen, walked away, and they're having a respiratory crisis now? They're going to be in bad shape. They're, the body is going to say, where's the oxygen? We don't have any. We're going to switch to lactic acid to get some ATP going here, but it's not enough because how much ATP do we get? Glycolysis and lactic acid fermentation or anaerobic metabolism only gives us two ATP. That's not enough to fuel the body to do anything. So people are struggling, shortness of breath, weakness, and acid levels are building and pH is dropping, and we have to intervene before that person dies. And that did happen um, in my clinical experience. We had a person that had really bad lungs, COPD. She wanted to use the restroom. So the, the, the respiratory therapy had said, yeah, let's reduce the oxygen delivery. She's doing better. Everything's great. Well, with the muscular activity of walking to the bathroom and sitting on the toilet, she went into respiratory distress, didn't get the oxygen she needed, and ended up dying because of lactic acid not supplying what she needed. She went into respiratory arrest, which caused cardiac arrest. And because her lungs were so bad, they couldn't get the oxygen she needed in the time that she needed it, and she passed away. So we really have to be careful. And this is where the, this is the take home message of metabolism, is if your patient is at risk of not getting enough oxygen and you're gonna walk them in the hallway or let them go to the bathroom or even move to the chair and they've got really crappy lungs, be prepared to up the oxygen while they're moving so they can fuel that activity. Because if you don't and they go into respiratory distress, they can die from that. And that's just a matter of paying attention to their oxygen needs and understanding that without oxygen, cells go into acid mode, lactic acid delivery. And if they can't fuel that with heavy breathing to get rid of that lactic acid, pH drops. OK, so if oxygen is available then, we have to enter into the mitochondrion. So the uh, mitochondrion is the factory where we make lots of ATP, but oxygen is required. If we're out in the cytoplasm doing a little bit of ATP production with the help of glycolysis and lactic acid fermentation, we don't need oxygen. That's in the cytoplasm. But when you go into the mitochondrion, that's where the Krebs cycle and electron transport chain are. So the mitochondrion, if you remember what that looks like, we'll go back this picture. I think I had one here. Oh, maybe not. I thought I did. Here's my picture of a mitochondrion. Okay, here's a mitochondrion. I'll make it a little bigger. This is that kind of kidney bean shaped organelle, if you remember. It has an inner membrane. The membrane on the inside of the mitochondrion is called the cristae. That's the membrane, the cristae. And the fluid inside, just in between the cristae, is called the matrix. So the matrix of the mitochondrion has enzymes for the Krebs cycle. And the cristae, the membrane, has special proton pumps and ATP synthase pump which are embedded in that matrix. So this is the membrane of the mitochondria that has these special proteins and the ATP synthase pump that are part of the electron transport chain. So when you talk about the two reactions that use oxygen in cellular metabolism, it's the Krebs cycle and the electron transport chain. The Krebs cycle occurs in the fluid of the mitochondria in the matrix, because that's where the enzymes are for this, these reactions. And the electron transport chain happens in the inner membrane, which we call, again, the cristae of the mitochondrion. So let's go back and zoom out a little bit here. So we have this pyruvic acid, 
And we have, let's say we have lots of oxygen present. This person is getting on a treadmill. They're going to do a little exercise. They're feeling the burn. They're doing a little heavy breathing, a little bit of lactic acid fermentation. But there's plenty of oxygen because they've got good lungs, and they're going to breathe to match their activity. So now we're going to go into the Krebs cycle in the mitochondrion. So if oxygen is present, we start this aerobic pathway, just meaning oxygen is present and there's good breathing going on. So the first step is the Krebs cycle or the citric acid cycle. It's in the mitochondrial matrix, again, which is the fluid. So you maybe want to add that after the word matrix. It's the fluid of the mitochondria. And we're going to break that pyruvic acid down. Or we might have fatty acids if, we, if we're burning fat. <clears throat> but it's going to be actively transported into the mitochondria, and that pyruvic acid is going to be converted to acetyl coenzyme A, and then it's going to enter into what we call the citric acid cycle. And we get all these little keto acids produced along the way as we make ATP. So acetyl coenzyme A is that kind of intermediate molecule that converted to citric acid, then isocitric acid. So these are all keto acids. And you've heard of ketoacidosis, right? Have you heard about that? And that's when people are not eating carbs and they're releasing these keto acids as a result of a low-carb diet. And that's fine. If you have healthy insulin production, the body can metabolize keto acids for fuel and you're okay. But if you're a diabetic, you're in trouble. Ketoacidosis, diabetic ketoacidosis, is what people who don't control their blood sugar end up with. And they end up, because they're only burning fat, fatty acids, because they can't use glucose, because there's no way to get glucose into their cells, because there's no insulin. And then they end up in the hospital, and they end up in the intensive care unit, actually. It, it's deadly, a diabetic ketoacidosis. And we'll talk more about that at the end of the semester. But anyway, as we go among these different keto acids, carbon dioxide is released, and we're adding, I mean, uh, again, taking away hydrogens and adding it to NAD+. So here we're making more of that NADH, adding more and making NADH, and at the same time, producing ATP. So we get an ATP for every pyruvic acid molecule that enters. How many pyruvic acid molecules are made from one glucose? Two. So how many ATP do we get at the end of the Krebs cycle then? Two. Yeah, we get two ATP at the end of the Krebs cycle. So we're still not to the 32, right? We need that precious 32 to really fuel our activities. So we have glycolysis that gave us two. We have the Krebs cycle that gave us two. Now all of these NADHs and H pluses are going to fuel the electron transport chain. So now we go to the next step. This is where oxygen is directly used. So, direct, so oxygen is needed for the Krebs cycle, but it's not directly used. So we'll talk about that. All right, so NADH that was formed in glycolysis in the Krebs cycle now releases those hydrogens, and they run through these series of proteins embedded in the membrane of the mitochondria, and we pull those hydrogens off. And the hydrogen atoms act like a fuel for this really cool looking pump here. It's called the ATP synthase pump. And those hydrogens fuel the production of ATP. So we have ADP and a phosphate is added to make ATP. Now there's a lot of steps along the way, but it's beyond the scope of our class. If this was a, um, a biochemistry, like a graduate level biochemistry class, we would go into all the details of how we go from here to here. But for our purposes, we don't need to know that kind of detail. All you need to know, though, is that those coenzymes, NADH and FAD, provide the protons to fuel the pump. So riboflavin and niacin, very important for fueling metabolism, providing the hydrogen atoms to make ATP.
So at the end of the electron transport chain and one glucose entering into the system, so one glucose comes into the cell, undergoes glycolysis, goes through the Krebs cycle, enters the electron transport chain, we get 32 ATP from one glucose molecule. So the job of the electron transport chain is to remove the hydrogen ions from these coenzymes and oxygen is converted to what, according to this diagram? Water. It's the f oxygen is the final electron acceptor, and it produces water. So that's the other waste product we said, right? Didn't we say the two waste products of metabolism were carbon dioxide and water? Where was the carbon dioxide produced? Let's go back and look. Carbon dioxide, carbon dioxide. So as these sugars were getting smaller and smaller, we're removing hydrogens and carbons, and the carbons bonded with oxygen to make CO2. So carbon dioxide is produced in the Krebs cycle, and water is produced in the electron transport chain. So again, we need those hydrogen ions from the coenzymes to fuel that pump. So the hydrogen ions fuel the ATP synthase pump to make ATP. And that is what is needed to combine phosphate to ADP. And where do the phosphates come from? Again, where does anything come from in our body that we're using to fuel metabolism? From our food. Yeah, from our food. So here's a really cool picture of the cristae, the mitochondrial membrane, and all those little circles. It looks like little raspberries, right? Those are all ATP synthase pumps. That's how many synthase pumps we have on our mitochondrial membrane. So we're making lots of energy. Wouldn't you agree? The more cells you have, the more mitochondria you have, the more energy you're producing. So when a person trains, when you train for a, a anything, any activity, any, any, uh, anaero or any aerobic activity, your body produces more mitochondria to fuel that activity. And that's why when you go up the steps and you're in shape, you recover more quickly because you have more mitochondria to fuel your activity compared to someone else that doesn't. And that's why we train, is to build more mitochondria, build more capillaries in our muscles that are you know, participating in that activity. So last topic before we switch into to the next thing next time. So when we look at energy usage, there's 686 kilocalories in one mole of glucose. Only 262 of that are converted to ATP energy. So we lose how much? 38% efficiency. So we lose 62% of the energy in glucose is lost as heat. Yeah, is lost as heat. So 38% of the energy in glucose actually is used for ATP. And our machines are, you know, in your cars and different devices, those are 10 to 30% efficient. So we're pretty efficient. We're a little more efficient than a typical machine, right? So this is just a nice summary. Glycolysis occurs out here in the cytoplasm. That's why it says cytosol here. We get a net of two ATP in glycolysis. And then it enters into the mitochondrion, enters into the Krebs cycle. We get two ATP from the Krebs cycle. And then it goes to the electron transport chain and we get 20, about 28. So all together, we can get anywhere from 32 to 36, depending on the cell of the body. Some cells are better than others, like the brain and the kidney are very efficient at energy production. So we'll do a quick review when we get back together next time, and then we'll talk about different types of metabolism of different food fuels.